Hang on, stop a minute. I forgot something. Let's just go back to the beginning. Because what I wanted to do is make a point just to say that we are not professional fly casters, but we have been casting for many, many years. Between Justin and myself, we've probably clocked up in the regions of about 85 years. So I think we could qualify as slightly above the average caster. And there are going to be points throughout the whole length of this video, some of which you'll be aware of, some you won't. But I hope it's useful and I hope you enjoy the video. Okay, let's go. Do you ever look across the water, see somebody cast in and think, wow, how do they do that? Okay, so you want to improve your casting. Now there's a lot of tutorial videos out there, but something must be going wrong because when I'm out on the banks, I can see far too many people struggling. And it's not just on the banks. I watch a lot of YouTube and I can see a lot of people struggling on YouTube. So what I'm gonna do is something a little bit different, trying to give you a better understanding of your tools. The more you know about the tools, the better off you are. So perfecting the fly cast can sometimes take years. Okay, there are a few naturals out there, but for most of us, it takes time. But what a lot of us boys have done is sea trout fishing at night. And that helps hone the casting skills. Because you can't see nothing, it's all by feel. So we'll start with the fly rods. And out there, there is a massive choice. There are so many rods. Now, if you ask me to recommend you a rod, I wouldn't have a clue. We all choose a rod for different reasons. Now, you could have a large hand, a small hand. So the grip on the rod will determine what rod you choose. Your build, you might not like the color. The color might be an issue. The length of the rod, but there are so many variations of rod but they'll only suit you so what suits me may well not suit you but there is one thing most rods will have in common and that's the action now this is where it could go wrong if i was recommending a rod on the channel and it happens to be a fast action and then somebody watching it who is a complete novice then goes and buys that rod they're going to find it very difficult. So the action of the rod has a lot to do with the fishing as well as the casting. And what we rely on most of all when we're casting is our sense of feel. And the best way to learn this is either with the medium action or the slow action rods. The slower action rod gives you more time to react as opposed to the fast action rod. The slow action rods also respond more during the cast, which makes it easy to know when the rod is loading. Whereas the fast action rods don't respond the same. Here we only have the tip of the rod working and to pick up on the senses with this rod is a lot more difficult. So it's more down to the timing and the timing is obviously a bit quicker than what it would be casting with the slower action rod. But the advantages of a fast action rod as opposed to the slow action is if you're fishing in windier conditions, you've got a big advantage. And putting out those bigger lines is a lot easier with the faster action rod. But as for the fishing of these rods, there are advantages and disadvantages. But I think I'll have to cover that in another video. So let's have a quick look at the floating lines. Now, what I'm work with here is going to be the probably the most popular uh, floating line out there, which is the weight forward. Like the rods, there is a huge selection out there. And for most of you, you may select the line because your buddy or you see it on YouTube, it's been promoted as the best fly line. Easy casting, blah, blah, blah. So you go and purchase it. But how much do you really know about your line? Okay, so this is my diagram of a simple line. Now, all lines are going to be set up differently, but it's more important understanding what each part is and how it works. So at the very back end of the line is the running line. And this has no real importance during the casting. But then we have it tapering up 
to the belly. So as you cast your rod, all of the energy is then transferred to this part of the line. And then it tapers back down again to the front taper. The front taper will vary anything from five foot up, but five foot being more aggressive, but the longer the taper, the more delicate the presentation. Okay, so the length of the belly and the taper have to be considered if you are learning fly casting. The total length here could reach up to 50 foot. And for most people when they're learning fly casting, to get that aerialized is gonna be quite tricky. So what I'd suggest is you start looking at a shorter length of belly and probably compromise on the front taper you might find that you can get a longer front taper and a shorter belly but it's important that you are loading the rod towards the back end of that belly to get the full potential for the cast there are a few manufacturers out there and what they're doing they're helping in the sense as by putting a bit of color on the line indicating when to shoot the line but i'm finding this to be of late more of a problem now when you're learning to fly cast you're getting into the fly cast and then all of a sudden you've lost concentration because you're looking for the color change and i wouldn't want to rely on this all the time because it means it's limiting your line choice if you find a perfect line for you but it hasn't got that color on the line to tell you when to shoot the line you're back to square one. So how are we going to know when to shoot the line if it hasn't got the color on it? Simple, all you gotta do is have a look at the box that the line come in and it'll give you the measurements of the front taper and the belly. If it's not on the box, I'm sure you'll get that online. Once you've got that measurement, let's just say it's 10 foot front taper and a 10 foot belly and we got a total of 20 foot. All we know then, the average rod is nine to ten foot so it's two rod lengths so all you're looking at is two rod lengths and then shoot okay let's get out on the water just to give you a bit of an idea this is my sort of trying to do it wrong i'm not very good at this uh, but i'm trying my best to show you what i see a lot of on the waters and on youtube Okay, like I say, I'm not very good at doing that. But there's three things I can see there. And I see it all the time whenever I'm on the waters and often when I'm watching YouTube. And one is you're far too physical. You're more physical than the rod. And the second thing, far too many back casts. Once you produce that many back casts, I know for certain you're on the running line. And if you're on the running line, you're losing energy. And thirdly, it's the back cast. It's the timing. You're far too quick. I'm knackered already. <laughs> okay, so when you become more physical, there's obviously less work for the rod to do. And that's going to make it very difficult to pick up on the rod's action. And the rod is never going to perform as it should do. So how many false casts do we have to make before we shoot the line? Now this is going to vary. It'll depend a lot on the line you're using, the rod you're using, and your own ability. For Justin and myself, it's normally between one and three, and that's normally on the faster action rods. So the only way I can think of working this one out is try a few false casts. If you like, put say, three false casts in, and get an idea of how much line you're producing on each false cast. So obviously the one thing you've got to make note of is how much line is outside the rod before you start your false cast. And this doesn't have to be exact as long as you're there or thereabouts. But whatever that measurement is, it'll give you a good idea as to how many false casts you need to make. So it's quite easy to work it out really. It's just knowing what line you've got on. It's pointless if you just put a line on without checking this out and that you've got a short front taper and a short belly and you're putting say four or five rod lengths out where you're probably 20 foot into the running line. You're obviously gonna lose the energy. So it's worth having a look at this and just checking where it is because the benefits to the cast are massive. 
and hopefully after a bit of time this will all be behind you and then you'll never have to do this again. You'll be casting like a pro and each line you pick up you won't have to check. It'll be done by feel. Okay so now for the timing on the back cast. Now this is quite critical and it doesn't just apply to a fast forward line, it applies to all lines. If you're not getting this right, you're not loading the rod, and if you're not loading the rod, you're not creating a decent cast. What I'm finding is, with a lot of people, is they start off okay, but their time delay as you extend that line. So when you're starting off, you've got a shorter line, and everything's going fine. But as you extend that line, you're going to have to delay the forward cast fractionally, allowing that line to lay out. This in turn then will load the rod fully and then enabling a much better and easier cast. So for a bit on casting styles. Now Justin and myself have totally different casting styles, but the result or the goal is much the same. So the first thing you'll notice with Justin's cast is it's done with pace. Now he can get away with this because he's on a fast action rod. But don't try and do this if you're on a medium or a slow action rod. So as he gets towards the end of the retrieve, Justin always hangs the flies. And then he performs sort of half roll cast, but he's keeping it aerialized. And then he's straight back into the cast again. And this casting style requires a bit more skill. And then there's what I do, which is a bit more relaxed. I slow it up a little bit and I break it into two parts. So the first thing is, even though you are on a faster action rod, you can slow them down a little bit. So as I'm drawing the line in, first thing I'll do is either a small roll cast or just flick the line out in front of me and leave it sit on the water for a moment and then I'll continue the cast. So this pause gives me the opportunity. One, it helps straighten the line out and tidy it up a bit but most importantly it brings my rod tip which was from fishing the hang high in the air back down to just above the water's surface and this means I can start loading the rod a lot sooner. Now you may well have noticed that Justin and myself hardly ever double haul. There's no real need for a double haul. If you're getting that timing right and loading that rod really well, the double haul for the average casting isn't required. It's only if you want to produce those really big casts or you may well find it handy uh, against a very strong headwind. But the left hand has got an importance and the important part with the left hand is making sure that there is never any slack line between the stripping guide and that hand. Now there's one thing I almost forgot about and it's during the cast, don't change the speed. Keep it consistent and it doesn't matter what speed you're casting at but you've got to keep it consistent. For a lot of the times, I see that some people are keeping it pretty consistent during the cast, but as they go to shoot the line, they hit it. That also messes up the cast. So how would we balance our rods to perform at their best? For most of the time, we're matching the line weight to the rod. On occasions, we do go below, but we never go over. So there is only one thing I know of that overweighting the rod can help you. And that, that it loads the rod very quickly. And it helps get the cast for that mid-range area. But there are so many negatives. One, prolonged overload of the rod can damage that rod. Two, you haven't got half the control. Three, creating the bigger cast is difficult. Four, the presentation of a heavier line as opposed to the lighter line. So learning to fly cast can be frustrating. But the thing is, we're constantly learning. Justin and myself, there are a lot of points that I watch that we could pick up on and improve. But it can also be enjoyable. I enjoy just fly casting. And once you get to a certain point, it'll also increase your fish catch. There are a lot of situations where a lot of people would not be able to fish, yet we can. This is when you're in the windier conditions. 
The technique is slightly different when you're fishing in stronger headwinds, but it does give us more options as to where and when we can fish. For a lot of you, you may not be able to go out when the conditions are as bad as this, which could be a shame if it happens to be the one day that you got off. But I think what's important is most of all is getting the cast right. Don't concentrate on distance. Work on one element at a time. But I'm sure with a few of these tips that you will improve.